Wendy, give us top four most impactful offseason moves so far around the association. Yeah, in no particular order, Brian, but Jimmy Butler electing not to pursue a contract extension with the Heat was huge in this offseason because he had indicated he wanted it. Pat Riley came on the record, said they weren't going to give it. If Jimmy made that an issue, he could have forced a trade. Teams were definitely paying attention to see if that would become an issue, but it was diffused. Butler decided he would not pursue it, would, uh, would play out the season. He's got a player option for next year, could become a free agent, so you keep that. One of the big moves right out of the gate, Mikhail Bridges being traded to the Knicks. After seeing what the Celtics did to the Eastern Conference and what they did during the postseason, you had to figure out a way to get a high-quality perimeter defender. Getting Mikhail Bridges alone was amazing. Getting him to play with the vanilla, with the vanilla, with the Villanova, uh, you know, you know, quartet already going over there in New York was a perfect fit. They paid a huge price, but it should really pay off for them. And it's a bet on Jalen Brunson as a star player. And speaking of star players, what just happened, uh, you know, a couple hours ago, really, Donovan Mitchell extending his contract in Cleveland. I think this is the biggest move in franchise history for the Cavs after uh, LeBron re-signing in 2014. There were a bunch of teams who six months ago thought Donovan was basically going to be a free agent and they would be able to trade for him this year if he didn't want this extension. Instead, he commits long-term to the Cavs, keeps them relevant in the Eastern Conference. And I'm going to say this one at the end here. This one happened very early and it was overlooked and shouldn't have been. Alex Caruso to the Thunder in a straight swap for Josh Giddy. No draft compensation is a steal. It could potentially end up affecting the championship race more than any of these other. Caruso is the perfect player for the Thunder. The swap out for Giddy covers up the defensive issues and the shooting issues that Giddy had. He's got a championship ring. Perfect addition, perfect price, great move by the Thunder, and definitely for the number one team in the West in, the, in terms of the standings, to get that type of player for that type of price really could be a, an important factor going forward. Okay, so I'm, I had to write them down. Butler, Bridges, Mitchell, Caruso. Call me Captain Obvious. I saw no Clay Thompson, mm -hmm. no Paul George. Courtney, what, give me your thoughts on the yeah, list. Yeah, I'm triggered by the Alex Caruso one as a Bulls fan, so thank you for that, Wendy. Um, yeah, looking at my list, no Paul George to Philadelphia. I, I, you know, creating that big three, and maybe it works out this year. Maybe it's a year in the making, but capitalizing on Joel Embiid in his prime. That wasn't on there. No Chris Paul to, you know, walking away for free for the Golden State Warriors because he was waived, I think that's huge. Victor Wembanyama gets to learn from a future Hall of Famer and have him distribute to him throughout his second season in the NBA. No Celtics re-signing everybody. <laughs> like, I, and, of course, the Klay Thompson one, which I know we talked about earlier, like certainly would have had that on my floor. But I, I like these. This, you know what this is? This is a dark horse list. Oh, stop. Of <laughs> oh, stop. Off-season moves Let it go. in the NBA. This isn't the ones that you would have expected right off the bat. They aren't the no, sexiest ones. These aren't the headline-grabbing ones as opposed to those it. four. I love it. That, that's what a true dark horse list or, is. Or, or Sam Ocho would say, it's a hodgepodge. Yeah, it's please. a hodgepodge. Go ahead, now, Chris. listen, you, you listen to the Hoop Collective. We understand that Wendy is going to bring a perspective on these huge moves. In Oklahoma City, I get why Alex Caruso is on his list. You're wrong, though, Brian. And, and here's why. <laughs> like, I, I look at the, the Paul George thing – and I'm concerned about his injury history. I know he was healthy this past year. And before that, it was four years where he missed almost 40% of the games. Problem is here, he's a perfect fit in Philadelphia. They had to do something in bringing in, you know, role players to fit as opposed to Paul George. In this particular situation, I don't think necessarily fit. And... It also affects the Clippers. Like, this is an impactful move because it really hurts the Clippers. And to me, it really hurts the Sixers. I know the Clippers were kind of maybe pushing him out a little bit because they didn't want to pay him uh, on, a, on a max contract or give him the max years. But it does hurt them, and they kind of sit now in limbo out west. Let me say this about Paul George. Um, obviously, that's a huge moment. And it's certainly the headline of the summer, without question. This is the fourth time in about seven years that Paul George has been a headliner of an of a, of a off-season move. One, when he was traded on, on, July, on June 30th from Indiana to Oklahoma City. 
the following year when the Lakers and other teams were ready to make a big pitch to him. And he re-signed, if you remember, just all of a sudden showed up at a party with Russell Westbrook. That became uh, a massive moment where the Thunder were able to keep him. Um, the year after that, when he was included in the one of the greatest and most amazing trades in the history of the NBA, where he and Kawhi Leonard went together to the Clippers. This is now this time. So this is now the fourth time that you could say that he was a leading headline in the offseason. The previous three have led to what? Mm. And that's my point. I'm not sure. I certainly recognize that the 76ers are a formidable team. I think they're going to need a year. I'm not going to put a lot of pressure on them to win this year. I know that that's the thing that you would say is, well, now Embiid's got to win. And I agree, especially for a team that hasn't gotten to the conference finals, that certainly would be the barrier. But historically, we see teams, when they hollow out their roster to create a big three, they always need more time to backfill that roster. And, I would, and I'm going to give the Sixers that time to backfill that roster. But I'm just, after, I'm tired of sitting here the first week of July and declaring that a Paul George arrival changes the everything because I believe that with the Clippers. I thought that team was set up to dominate. Now, we had the pandemic, and that obviously affected Paul significantly. But Bottom line, I'm just going to wait back a little bit before I'm willing to just assume that this fit will mean the changing of the guard somewhere. You know, there are a number of people who believe that since they've made this move, that it, it is indeed the Sixers that's the biggest threat to the Celtics this upcoming season. What do you think? Biggest threat in the Atlantic Division? The biggest threat in the league? Because the Thunder play in the league. And the Thunder were the number one team in the West. It was a tight series with the Mavericks. They added uh, Alex Caruso and Isaiah Hartenstein and gave up really not much. Giddy was being benched in that series against Dallas. That upgrade is, um, is enormous. Their size was a problem against all those, those Dallas bigs in that series, all those lobs and everything. They've now addressed that. Plus, they're still holding all of those first-round draft picks, which they can use if they want to still upgrade their roster. That's just talking Oklahoma City. That doesn't bring up Minnesota, who has also improved this offseason, uh, acquiring two players in the draft. Uh, and I don't think Anthony Edwards is getting worse. And they're keeping their team together. Their ownership is unflucked, but they've, they're keeping their team together. And Denver. Now, Denver has taken a bit of a step back, um, but Denver might have gone seven games with the Celtics and if they had reached the finals. They didn't. They weren't even close in the end. But Denver was 2-0 and against the Celtics during the season. So that's just three teams in the West. I didn't even mention the Mavericks. Of course, the Mavericks. That's four teams in the West. And I think the Knicks and the, and the Bucks have something to say. So, um, you know, I think it, the Celtics are definitely in first uh, in the league. And uh, the, the, the Sixers are definitely going to be a contender. And we'll see how they come together. Their roster isn't complete. But I'm just not going to... You know, I've just seen too many of these big three teams come together and was assume that it's going to work right away. To, and I'm not doing this as an insult to the Sixers. I'm doing this out of respect to how hard what they're trying to do is. Mm. I see you shaking your head, Court. I would agree with that. I think that the, I won't put the 76ers in that biggest threat category to the Celtics right now. If, I'm, if I have to pick some team, and I'll stay in the East, I'll say it's the New York Knicks, and I'll say why in a minute, but the Celtics are the biggest threat to themselves. They just resigned everybody, as we had mentioned. They, unless some, unless there's injuries, it's health and probably like attrition that is the biggest threat to a team that is prime now to go repeat for a championship. A team that won 64 games in the regular season last year, and un, like the only other way that I see this working where they get upended is if it is this New York Knicks team because we think about the things that Boston has that would have the edge over everybody else. Three point shooting. And, def and defense, more or less. Well, the New York Knicks just re-signed OG Ananobi, who changed their defensive fortune when they traded for him. They went 20-3 and three with him last year. They now have him under contract for a five-year deal. And the Mika Mikhail Br Bridges acquisition is huge for this team. So you have a starting five. It's going to be Brunson, DiVincenzo, Bridges, Julius Randle, who, by the way, was not playing in that series throughout the postseason. So I can only imagine what a threat that's going to look like when they have a fully healthy squad next year. Mitchell Robinson, then Josh Hart, and Miles McBride as key reserves. So that's a pretty formidable top seven that you're rolling out. But 
in terms of the Celtics, you think about the three-point shooting that we just mentioned. They had eight guys shoot threes last, more than 100 threes last year. The Knicks had three. And on the defensive end, the Celtics still have that edge when they held the Knicks to, over, to under 104 points in four or five games last year. So it's the Celtics versus themselves, which is a kind of a weird thing to say. But, hey, they're going all in on it this year before the CBA changes again it's in a year. It's interesting because Porzingis will be out for six months Yeah, he mm-hmm. comes back from that injury. But you're right. I mean, they specifically re-signed OG and went and got Mikael Bridges for Tatum and Brown. To well, make that's sure the that thing. they can lock down those two wings. What do you think? Yeah, that's the thing. Uh, you're talking about the idea that Philly's gone big three here and the Knicks have big one, really, in Jalen Brunson, and he has become that on their watch. They really stuck to the idea that you have to keep your culture moving in the right direction, you have to have the perfect fit for guys, and they really did this, Brian, to your point, to defend those two guys in Boston. Mm -hmm. The Knicks did this Mikhail Bridges move trade uh, in mind to just that. They overpaid for him, and they knew they were going to have to because there's no way the Nets were going to let them break a t- or win a tie with any other team that was uh, offering anything here. Bridges and Ananobi defending out on the wings. And Hart. Like, that's impressive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's a lot to work with, Courtney. I, I Personally, I, it's a team that you would never look at on paper and say that is a team that would be the biggest Celtic, uh, biggest threat to the Celtics because there are not enough of the massive names on there. There aren't two or three of the massive. It really, if we're being honest, when it comes to the superstars in the league, Jalen Brunson is just now entering that mainstream thought of the average fan. Mm-hmm. And they're looking at it, how's that team beating them? You watch the game, you understand how that team's beating them. The fun- 